Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Simakaitis, and I'm coordinator in the PFF Help Center, and I'd like to welcome you to the final day of PFF Summit 2021. Thank you for joining us for the first live session of the day when PF worsens, common cold, influenza, COVID-19, or worsening PF. Our presenter for this morning's session is Rebecca Edwards. Rebecca is a nurse practitioner at the Norton Thoracic Institute, St. John's Hospital, or sorry, St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center in Phoenix, Arizona. Her expertise is in the management of advanced and complex lung diseases. Rebecca received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Arizona State University and is experienced in pulmonology, cardiology, and thoracic surgery. She also received her doctorate in Doctorate of Nursing Practice from Arizona State University and has practiced in pulmonology ever since. Rebecca's clinical interests include interstitial lung disease and genetic lung disease. In addition to medical management of diseases of the lung, Rebecca's focus is on holistic care and quality of life for patients who have advanced lung disease. And now I'd like to turn the session over to Rebecca Edwards. Hello and welcome to the difference between colds, flu, influenza, COVID-19, and pulmonary fibrosis exacerbations. I'm Rebecca Edwards. I'm a nurse practitioner at Norton Thoracic Institute at St. Joe's Hospital in Phoenix. And what we'll be talking about today is really what happens when there's an acute change in respiratory status in people who have pulmonary fibrosis. And like the name of our topic, highlight, sometimes this can be a bit more difficult than expected. So we'll go through a number of different things. We'll talk through um, some of the different manifestations of respiratory changes, differential diagnoses, and what you can do to partner with your team. These are my disclosures. So here's our overview. We'll review various respiratory infectious processes and signs and symptoms associated We'll also talk about ILD exacerbations, both IPF and non-IPF. We'll review the diagnostic process that happens when worsened respiratory symptoms occur in the setting of interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis. And then we'll do a little overview of treatment decisions that happen along with this. And then we'll finally discuss strategies for preventing respiratory infections or respiratory worsening and then discuss tips on how you can partner with your care team and really take control of um, being ready in case these unexpected events happen. So to give us a little scenario, um, we have Mr. Smith here, who is a 60-year-old man who's been diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, IPF. He develops a new cough that's increased from his usual cough. He has some increased shortness of breath maybe a bit of nasal discharge and often notes just some general fatigue. He makes an appointment with his pulmonologist to be evaluated and sits down, discusses his symptoms, his physical exam with his pulmonologist is completed, what's next? So once new symptoms have come up, typically what starts is um, a consideration of all the various things that could be triggering this change. And we call it the differential diagnosis list. So this right here gives us an overview of some of the things that should be considered when there's been an acute change like this. So we'll go through each one of these and talk through some of the symptoms which are often remarkably similar to each other. And then some of the complications that people who have underlying chronic disease can face when these occur. So common things occurring commonly, we'll start with the common cold. And actually what we refer to as the cold can be caused by over 200 different viruses. Um, you know, the, one of the most common ones is called rhinoviruses, which are estimated to account for up to 35% of colds that occur um, annually. And even within rhinoviruses, there's more than 100 different subtypes of this particular virus. So in addition to these viruses, colds are also commonly caused by adenoviruses, coronaviruses, um, and of note, this is different than um, the COVID-19 virus that we'll discuss later. These are common coronaviruses that we see every year, human metanumaviruses, um, and we'll discuss a few more. 
So when you contract a cold, typically this is happening about 24 to 72 hours after exposure that the symptoms will appear. There is some seasonal changes in terms of what viruses we're looking for. Um, with cold weather often having specific viruses that we see. Now, this particular slide includes a little bit more than just cold viruses, but it illustrates the point pretty well that there is a seasonality to this. So what's being de de denoted as um, PIV is um, para-influenza virus. So you can see types one and two tend to cluster a bit more in the fall, while type three is more in the spring. And then we see um, HMP, human metanumavirus, a bit more in the spring, adenovirus, a bit more in the spring. And then quite a bit of rhinovirus, although this tends to really concentrate um, fall and spring. And then we also have um, RSV and then our typical seasonal influenza, which occurs mostly during cold weather. So the time of year that the illness occurs can give some clues on to what virus could be responsible. Typically, Colds are transmitted through hand contact, so touching the hand of a person who has that virus on their hands and then touching um, your own mucous membranes, your own eyes or mouth. And then small particle droplets, so if someone who is um, infected coughs or sneezes near you and that lands um, on you. Symptoms of a cold, so our common colds or simple colds are kind of what we all know and expect. So think nasal discharge, nasal obstruction, think sneezing, and that dry or scratchy throat. Um, there may be low-grade fevers, typically not high fevers with a simple cold. Um, there can also be some general feeling of fatigue or not feeling well, ear pressure, headache, sinus pressure. People who have underlying chronic disease, however, will be a bit more at risk of developing lower respiratory tract involvement. Um, and this is typically more common in people who are older and also those who um, might have underlying disease such as ILD or who are immunosuppressed. We'll do go a little bit more towards or through some of the lower respiratory manifestations here. So the most common lower respiratory manifestation would be bronchitis. Um, which is an inflammation of the airways of the lung. And this contrasts with, the, with pneumonia in the sense that pneumonia will infect the lung tissue itself, while bronchitis is the airways of the lung. So symptoms of bronchitis will commonly include cough, some mild shortness of breath, wheezing or crackles. And this typically either comes along with the cold-like symptoms or can follow the cold symptoms. And then common viruses that are responsible are parainfluenza, the coronaviruses, rhinoviruses, RSV, and human metanumavirus. Um, pneumonia is a little bit more serious of the lower respiratory involvement. So this will typically manifest with a bit more severe symptoms. So this can include higher fevers, more pronounced shortness of breath and cough, which may or may not be productive. So typically, Viruses such as influenza or COVID-19 have a more strong association with pneumonia. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about those in the slides to come. However, there are cold viruses that are, can be associated with viral pneumonia. Um, and these are known to cause more severe lung disease in people who have underlying lung conditions such as ILD or, or immunosuppressed. So the flu, I'm including this terminology, and I think we all say this quite a bit and sometimes aren't as exact about what we mean. So I think when people say the flu, typically we mean any sort of respiratory virus. Sometimes we talk about the stomach flu, which can include GI viruses. Um, to be strictly correct, the flu is really intended to mean influenza, um, which we see typically every year we will have an epidemic of influenza in the winter. So the primary strains of influenza that cause disease in the summer are influenza A and influenza B. There are other types of flu, however, um, they're less likely to cause the extent of infections that, um, that we expect um, in the winter months. So typically infection with flu, you'll start to see symptoms one to four days from exposure. And then the important thing to keep in mind is that people can actually be infectious or contagious 24 to 48 hours uh, before the illness onset. So if you're exposed to the flu, it's something to keep an eye out for and keep in mind. 
on an annual basis, about 5 to 20% of the United States population will develop a case of the flu. Um, it's responsible for over 30,000 annual outpatient visits and ER visits and about 200,000 uh, hospitalizations annually. So people who are at increased risk of complications from the flu are typically people who are 65 and older, have weakened immune systems, or who have chronic underlying um, diseases. So this gives us a little overview of influenza cases by year since the 2010-2011 flu season. And so you can see there's some variance and every year the predominant influenza strains are tracked. Um, and there's many different substrains of influenza A and influenza B that we see in varying numbers year to year. Um, obviously this didn't include our most recent winter season, which was the 2020-2021 season. And um, as many of you know, we did see quite a bit less flu than usual that year. So transmission of flu is thought to be mostly droplet. So that's exposure to the respiratory secretions of an infected person. So um, think about when someone coughs or sneezes. Um, also, if you touch a surface that has the influenza virus on it and then touch your face or your mucous membranes, that can cause infection and then possibly small particle aerosols. So meaning that um, it's aerosolized in the air and you can breathe it in. Symptoms of influenza, typically fever, headaches, uh, myalgias, meaning body aches, a general feeling of being unwell, um, cough, sore throat, nasal discharge. And then really the major complication of pneumonia is going to, or I'm sorry, of influenza is going to be pneumonia. And that can be purely viral pneumonia, meaning that the influenza virus has caused the pneumonia, but flu can also be associated with secondary bacterial infections that are superimposed. COVID-19, um, I think we've all become more familiar with in the last year and a half. And this is caused by a specific type of coronavirus, which is separate from the ones we've discussed so far. And this falls um, in relationship to the other SARS viruses, so severe acute respiratory syndrome viruses. Incubation of COVID is typically, we think, occurs within 14 days of exposure, but really the most common is about five days after exposure to develop symptoms. This is a little screenshot of the waxing and waning of how many cases we've seen in the US dating back to February, 2020. And you can see we've kind of been um, up and down and are a bit up again. As far as symptoms, typically cough is a predominant symptom, fever is common, body aches, headaches, shortness of breath, sore throat, GI symptoms, changes in taste or smell. And again, the major complication of COVID-19 is going to be pneumonia, which can lead to acute respiratory um, distress and respiratory failure. Um, in terms of people who are at risk of developing pneumonia, is again, people who are 65 and older, people who have underlying lung disease, they'll be at higher risk of complications from COVID-19. So as far as transmission, breathing in air close to an infected person and um, potentially inhaling some, some, some particles that contain the virus. And then having um, droplets of someone cough or sneeze near you and have that land on your own mucous membranes. And then again, touching your eyes, nose or mouth with um, hands that have the virus on them. Bacterial infections um, can also cause similar symptoms to all that we've discussed so far. Um, so commonly is pneumonia, community acquired pneumonia have listed here. Um, and symptoms of pneumonia will again be similar to what we've discussed. So cough, increased shortness of breath, feeling tired, potentially fevers. And then I've listed here some of the more common bacteria that can cause community acquired pneumonia. Um, however, this can be caused from a range of typical and atypical bacteria. Um, community acquired pneumonia is fairly common and accounts for about 4.5 million office visits and ER visits every year. Um, aspiration can also lead to pneumonia, so stomach contents going into the lung. And this is important because we know that people who have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis have a strong link with the incidence of acid reflux disease. 
And also people who have autoimmune lung disease are often, um, are often affected with esophageal dysfertility as well. So when we look at factors that predispose to the development of pneumonia, it's people who are 65 and older, have underlying chronic lung disease, dysphagia, trouble swallowing, or esophageal dysmotility um, can increase the risk, along with being immunosuppressed or smoking. Bronchitis, so inflammation of, and infection of the airways, more commonly occurs uh, as a result of a viral infection, but can occur from bacterial causes as well. And then finally, pulmonary fibrosis exacerbations. Um, so an exacerbation is considered to be a sudden worsening in the setting of ILD, so in the setting of IPF lung disease or non-IPF interstitial lung disease. And this can be triggered from a pre-existing condition. So should there be an infection with a virus or bacteria, this type of thing can trigger a pulmonary fibrosis exacerbation, or they can also occur in the absence of any triggering, um, any triggering agent. So I've divided these up a bit because IPF exacerbations are defined a little bit more precisely than ILD exacerbations in general. So the definition of an IPF exacerbation is an acute clinically significant respiratory deterioration characterized by evidence of new widespread alveolar abnormality. So again, we're seeing someone present with increased respiratory symptoms, and then there's some specific findings on testing which you have to meet the criteria for. So again, we have um, evidence that IPF exacerbations can be triggered by respiratory infections such as cold viruses, flu viruses, COVID, um, and other triggers. So the annual incidence in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis of exacerbations is thought to be about four to 20%. Um, and these are important because they're often associated with a marked loss of lung function, although there can be quite a range of severity. So if an IPF exacerbation is happening, that's something that um, your pulmonologist will want to catch and start treating as early as possible. Now, ILD exacerbations are similar. So they can be um, triggered by another factor, such as an infection, or can also occur in the absence of, um, of an obvious reason for worsening. Um, these are also characterized by a respiratory deterioration and typically will have new changes on CT. Um, these are thought to be less common than IPF exacerbations. Um, however, some recent studies have shown that patients who have autoimmune-related ILD may have similar rates of exacerbation. So this is some data from um, IPF literature, and this is just kind of walking through the process of deciding whether or not an exacerbation is of known cause or unknown cause. And I'll go through in a little bit more detail some of the CT findings, but really when determining if something is an ILD exacerbation, it involves that search for trigger and then, and then um, confirmation of changes on CT imaging. And what this slide is showing is kind of a picture example of what we think happens in an acute exacerbation. So this is showing you potential triggers, which we've talked about. So infectious agents, um, acid, meaning breathing in of stomach contents, which triggers, um, which triggers a change in which lung disease can progress more quickly than expected. So what you're seeing on the year side of your screen is that it would take years for pulmonary fibrosis to worsen as we're seeing just slight changes. However, in the setting of an acute exacerbation, we can see pretty dramatic changes even in the space of a week. So symptoms of a pulmonary fibrosis exacerbation, again, we're gonna see shortness of breath, perhaps difficulty exercising, cough, which can occur with or without sputum production. Um, symptoms will usually develop over days to around a month. The criteria used to be that symptoms had to develop within the preceding 30 days of having CT changes, although that has been relaxed somewhat on our more recent guidelines. And then pulmonary fibrosis exacerbations can be accompanied by fatigue, fever, chills, and flu-like symptoms. So it can be tough sometimes to differentiate this from some of the previous 
um, entities, the colds and flus and bacterial infections that we've discussed so far. So a few additional considerations are extra pulmonary causes of worsening. So I've listed just a few here. So pulmonary embolism, a blood clot in the lung is another thing to be considered. So this can present with shortness of breath. It may be accompanied by chest pain, leg swelling, but can also um, present with things like cough or even wheezing. Heart failure, which would cause a backup of fluid into the lungs can cause shortness of breath, cough, abdominal pain. Often we'll see leg swelling along with this and fatigue. And then patient-specific diagnosis um, situation. So depending on the other line, underlying disease, specifically if there's underlying autoimmune diseases, there's um, things can be considered like muscle weakness, like development of pulmonary hypertension. So as we go through these various differential diagnoses, as you can see, by symptoms alone, it can be difficult to differentiate between these different triggering agents and to try to differentiate um, what, is an under, what is an underlying infection, what is pulmonary, what is extra pulmonary, and what could be an ILD exacerbation, which is important to catch. So we'll move forward into the next piece of our talk where I'm gonna talk a little bit more about evaluation and treatment decisions. So, the first piece will be history. So we've talked a lot about incubation times and exposures, and often through a history of exposure to sick contacts, contacts or how quickly symptoms came on, we can derive clues about what is causing the acute change. And then also consideration of comorbidities. So people who have significant esophageal disease, consideration of aspiration pneumonia may be a bit higher on the list than in someone who we know does not have significant acid reflux disease. And then physical exam, findings like wheezing or more diminished breath sounds can point us towards um, perhaps a bronchitis or crackles in a certain area may make us concerned for a pneumonia. So clinical testing. So once a change has been identified, typically everyone will go through some kind of this, uh, of these tests. So there's a number of important ones, pulmonary function tests, I think most of you all are quite familiar with. And typically what we see when there's a change is a reduction in PFTs. Often there can even be a little bit of a change in terms of um, physiology of the PFTs, depending on what's going on. And again, those changes are pointers as your own clinical team tries to narrow down what exactly is going on. Six minute walk test or walking oximetry. This is often used to determine if there's been a change in oxygen needs. And this is relevant because um, the more that the lung tissue is involved, the more common it is that we'll see a reduction in um, SpO2, so in pulse ox, and need for higher oxygen supplementation. Echocardiogram is an ultrasound of the heart, and this can be used to look for things like heart failure, like pulmonary hypertension. And then viral testing, um, we've all become more familiar with this last year. So influenza testing is common every year, and typically that can be done through um, swabs, through nasal washes. Um, and that will test for influenza A and B typically. And then COVID-19 testing is done in the um, setting of a respiratory change and then other respiratory viral tests. So what we often use and what a lot of clinicians use is respiratory PCRs to try to isolate respiratory viruses. And many panels will test for, um, for all the common cold viruses, common bronchitis viruses and can isolate those to really identify what the underlying cause of the respiratory change is. Bacterial cultures, typically this is in the form of sputum cultures for patients who are treated as outpatients. Again, this is looking to isolate specific bacteria. Um, this can also be looked at in blood, looking for identifying, identifying bacteria. And then rarely bronchoscopy, although in the setting of respiratory compromise, um, bronchoscopy is rarely done. And then laboratory testing. So this can involve anything from checking a CBC to look for a white blood cell count, which could be suggestive of infection, looking at a cardiac BNP to look for evidence of fluid overload, which could be causing shortness of breath, 
And then looking at inflammatory markers um, to get an idea of how much of an inflammatory response is occurring in the body. These are also used commonly in autoimmune diseases. And then chest imaging. Um, chest x-ray can be used like I had mentioned before, CT chest is really the gold standard to look for evidence of an ILD exacerbation. So CT chest can be done with or without contrast. If there's concern for blood clots, typically the CT is done with contrast to look at the pulmonary vasculature. So here's some CT images from a person with an acute exacerbation. And what you can see here is a background of pulmonary scarring. So we can see um, some of this background scarring here. And then we have superimposed on here that sort of ground glass grayish looking changes, which signifies an increase in inflammation and damage in the lung. And so this is what would be looked for in CT to try to exclude a pulmonary fibrosis exacerbation. So if a trigger is identified in the workup that we've discussed, treatment is first gonna be aimed towards the triggering agent itself. So for example, virus specific, most of our cold viruses, they're gonna be treated with supportive measures. In rare cases, sometimes antiviral medications can be used off label for this, but for the most part, it'll be supportive care. For influenza, we do have some antiviral agents that are readily available. I think the most commonly used one is what we call Tamiflu. And typically that is initiated early on in the disease course. So Tamiflu can reduce complications of the flu by about 45% and can reduce the incidence of hospitalization by about 63%. The trick with Tamiflu is that it does need to be started within 48 hours of symptom onset to get that type of action. So it's important to be monitoring for those symptoms um, early on in seeking medical attention. There's also a dose of Tamiflu that can be given prophylactically to people who have been exposed to influenza. And then COVID-19. So treatment for COVID-19 is obviously evolving. However, it continues to include treatment with steroids. Um, we have monoclonal antibodies that are used specific for COVID-19 and then remdesivir as an antiviral agent as well. For bacteria, typically if bacterial infection is suspected, the start will be with a broad spectrum antibiotic. So this means antibiotics that will cover many of the common bacteria that cause pneumonia. Otherwise, once um, a specific bacteria has been identified, antibiotic selection can be narrowed down so that it's tailored to that specific bacteria. And then persons who have a history of infection, that also can help guide antibiotic selection. And then other causes. So um, these again are our extra pulmonary causes such as a pulmonary embolism, a blood clot in the lung. Typically that'll be treated with anticoagulation um, and then other procedures as appropriate. So heart failure, typically this will be treated with diuretic. So getting fluid off and clearing the lungs of the excess fluid will, to improve shortness of breath and then optimization of cardiac function um, with cardiac medications to support hemodynamically. So if an ILD flare is suspected in the setting of either a trigger or in the setting of no trigger being identified, there is a few pillars of care. So general treatment for an ILD flare um, is really based on best available evidence. So what will typically be done is the person's treated with high dose steroids, and that can be done a number of ways. In people who are hospitalized, that can be done via IV treatment or in an outpatient infusion center via IVs, or it can be prescribed as oral steroids such as prednisone. And typically these are started at fairly high doses and then tapered down rather slowly. Um, we also look to optimize comorbidities, meaning that we're treating things like um, diabetes, we're treating things like acid reflux in an effort to try to um, optimize the response to therapy. And then in patients who have underlying lung disease or non-IPF lung disease, treating that underlying cause. So for those with autoimmune lung disease, this can mean looking at the treatment of the rheumatologic condition and optimizing that as well. The area of IPF and ILD exacerbations is one that's still actively 
um, being learned about and there's ongoing clinical trials. So in addition to these general treatment principles, often clinical trials are offered as we continue to learn about the optimal treatment. I do just want to mention the antifibrotics that we have available. I don't think we have a good understanding as to whether or not um, these have a place in treating exacerbations. There's really not um, a good data to suggest to us what their role is. However, I do want to mention that nintetinib, which is commonly known as OFEV, it was studied and um, it does reduce the risk to the first acute IPF exacerbation. And that was seen in the clinical trial supporting the FDA approval of OFEV. For, for perfinidone, Espriate, that wasn't included in their, um, in their labeling of their medication. However, there have been a few studies looking at the incidence of acute exacerbations in people who take perfinidone. Um, for example, one study which followed a cohort of patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis published their experience um, noting that 14% of patients in their placebo branch um, are patients who are not taking perfinidone experienced acute exacerbations while no one in the um, perfinidone treated uh, patients in their study experienced exacerbations. And then in 2017, there was a paper published looking at patients who had had acute exacerbations. And what they found is that patients who were on perfinidone had improved survival three months after their exacerbation compared to patients who had not been on perfinidone. So that gives us a little bit of information on how these antifibrotics may affect um, the experience of exacerbations. So in addition to treatment of triggers and underlying care for an ILB flare, um, I just wanted to go over a bit about supportive care. So this will include things like making sure that oxygen supplementation is appropriate. Often if there is a illness, there can be a transient need for increased oxygen supplementation. So it's important to make sure that's sufficient. And then ensuring comorbidities are controlled. So if steroid treatment occurs, um, usually making sure that blood sugars in the setting of diabetes are controlled, that we're addressing heart disease um, and so on. And then proper location of care. Many people who experience colds, flus, changes in respiratory function can be treated at home. And some people do need hospitalization for that more intense treatment. And so that's a decision that's made person to person with their care team. And then importantly, follow up after um, an illness or a flare is important. And that's because after a flare has occurred, trending that recovery and seeing how um, the lungs are going to behave is important um, as some people may experience respiratory deterioration afterwards. So you want your team involved to make sure that you're recovering as optimally as possible. So as far as prevention goes, um, we have vaccinations available for a number of these conditions, which can commonly um, trigger changes. So influenza vaccination, as you know, comes out every fall. And the CDC's recommendation is that that flu vaccine is received actually by the end of October. And then keep in mind, it takes the body about two weeks to develop antibodies after vaccination. So you have to get it a couple of weeks before you're really wanting to make sure that you have those antibodies developed. The flu shot is thought to reduce the risk of flu by about 40 to 60% in the general population. And then also is associated with the reduced risk of hospitalization, um, especially ICU hospitalization and death. So high priority groups for vaccination include people 65 and older and those with chronic lung disease. Pneumococcal vaccines protect against bacteria which cause pneumonia along with other conditions. And vaccination with the pneumococcal vaccines is a bit more nuanced. So there's two versions, there's Pneumovax and Prevnar 13. In adults with chronic lung disease, it's recommended that everyone 19 to 64 receives a dose of Pneumovax and all adults 65 and older are, are um, vaccinated with both Pneumovax and Prevnar 13 vaccination. For COVID-19 vaccination, um, recommendations again continue to evolve. So at this time, we have our two mRNA vaccines, which are two dose initial series, and then um, Johnson & Johnson Janssen uh, one dose series. And booster shots are now recommended in certain scenarios. 
and then lifestyle modification. So we've learned a lot about this. Um, and the great news is that what we've been doing the last year and a half in the setting of COVID is also quite effective in, a, in, um, in avoiding other respiratory viruses, such as the flu and cold viruses. So things like staying home when sick and avoiding other people who are sick, masking, hand washing, social distancing, optimizing comorbidities, meaning that we're treating the whole person and all of the things that are going on, and then general healthy living. So exercising routinely, eating well, um, and maintaining our immune systems as much as we can. So when we start talking about partnering with your care team, um, it's pretty well documented in the respiratory literature that patients who have one, disease education and understand what's going on with their lungs, and who also have an action plan in the setting of changes, um, specifically a written action plan, tend to do better and feel that they have more control over the disease and are able to avoid hospitalizations. So I think it's a bit harder in ILD to make a one-size-fits-all action plan because in spite of the different interstitial lung disease, looking the same, presenting with same symptoms, really these diseases can be kind of quite different when we're talking about the underlying reason for them occurring and even the treatments that are employed. So what I'd encourage you to do as you sit and think about how you specifically can partner with your team to try to prevent and make a plan for if respiratory um, changes happen, I'd encourage you to sit and first make a list of who all of your team members are. And this is just a start here of who might be involved in your care, but I'd encourage you to consider your primary care provider, your pulmonologist, your ILD center, and all the pieces there who may be interfacing with you. Um, we have pulmonary rehab specialists, people may have rheumatologists and other specialists to treat all aspects of their own, um, of their own care. So as you sit and brainstorm that, I would encourage you to ask a few of your providers some questions so that you're prepared. And here's a list of what I think would be helpful. So one, asking your care team, what symptoms do you specifically need to monitor for? So is it shortness of breath? Is it changes in cough? Are there certain parameters that you should be monitoring, such as your pulse oximetry at home? Is there anything else that you need to be monitoring or keeping track of? And then if there is a change, at what point should you be seeking medical attention? Does it need to do, is there a period of time that you can wait? And then who specifically should you be calling? Um, at what point should you call your pulmonary office versus your primary care office? And then I would encourage you to specifically identify who the person is that you call. And this can be office to office. Some offices will communicate via portal. Some offices will ask that you call the nurse directly in the event that you're sick. And so I'd encourage you to write down who your point of contact is at all of your offices and for, which, uh, and for which symptoms you call which office. And then with your teams, especially your ILD team, is there any home protocols that should be in place for changes in your respiratory status? What should you do if there's a change in oxygenation? And then finally, what are signs that you do need to go to the ER or seek emergency assistance? So I'd encourage you to write down the answer to these and then um, also make a list throughout um, the time between your visits about what you need to communicate with your team and have a space for that. So things to communicate would include medication issues, um, including if you're needing to take a break or you're having trouble with one of your medications. These are things to communicate clearly with your team as this might affect um, your risk of, of an illness oxygen changes, vaccination needs, making sure you're staying up to date on those and doing everything you can to keep yourself healthy. And then new medications or new medical diagnoses. And I've seen a number of really wonderful organization systems from um, many of my patients. But what I would suggest is that you take these questions and you write them down and then write down the responses from your team and then make yourself some kind of quick reference where you can look to trigger in your mind if this change happens, what the protocol is in terms of who you call. And then I'd encourage you to have the person you're calling and the number you're calling all lined up in your booklet here. Um, it's also a great place to keep those, those items that you need to discuss with your team or keep questions so you make sure that you're getting all your questions answered when you have your visits. So in summary, 
The differential diagnoses for acute respiratory and changes in ILD is broad. We've talked through a lot of different viruses, bacteria, as different things that can cause a change. Workup of respiratory changes involves identifying triggering factors, and then treatment involves treating known factors along with general guidelines in the setting of ILD exacerbations. Preventative health is important, so making sure you're staying up on your vaccines and you're doing everything you can to prevent infections uh, with lifestyle modifications. And then finally, being prepared ahead of time involves partnering with all aspects of your care team. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for sharing all of that fantastic information with us. Uh, very informative and super helpful. Uh, we do have a number of questions and we have a, a nice amount of time um, to discuss some of these, which I think will give us a little more information. So I want to first ask, um, we do have a question. Um, we talked about some of the primary causes of exacerbation, um, but also this questioner is asking how much damage they typically do. So, um... You know, like I spoke about, there's various different causes. Um, there's some data suggesting maybe 20% of exacerbations could be due to infections. That's from a paper in 2016. Um, unfortunately, the damage can be quite severe um, in a full-fledged exacerbation. So, you know, while not every patient has to go into the hospital, often it may require hospitalization. And typically, um, Typically survival, it can be, you know, 50% or a little bit worse over the three to four months after an exacerbation. Um, so, and that damage is often irreversible. So, and there can be quite a bit of damage done, which is why we want to try to catch these exacerbations early on if they're going to occur. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Um, here's a great question. How can a patient tell if they are having an exacerbation or whether it's just a cold or flu? I think you might have sort of covered this, but um, we might be able to discuss it a little further. And does this have to be determined by a physician? So typically, if it's going to be an exacerbation, the symptoms will differ a little bit from just your average cold. So when you think about a simple cold, think about, you know, nasal congestion, think about sneezing, having to blow your nose a lot, a lot of it being kind of like concentrated in your head. In the event of, a, of, a, of an ILD exacerbation, typically what you're going to see is increased shortness of breath. You're going to see an increased cough that's typically not that clearing of the throat cough, think more of like a deep change in your normal cough. Um, and often we'll see patients have differences in oxygen requirements. So you can kind of tell a little bit the difference just based on where your symptoms are coming from. But really, if you're gonna have a true diagnosis of an exacerbation, that's gonna be diagnosed by a physician or some type of medical provider. And really what the hallmark is gonna be when we're looking at if an exacerbation is happening or not, it's gonna be what's seen on the CT imaging. So what the CT will show is it'll show those um, ground glass changes that are superimposed on the disease that's already there. Um, whereas if an exacerbation is not happening, we might just see a focal change, maybe see changes of um, just fluid retention or an isolated pneumonia, something like that, that would not be consistent with an exacerbation. So if there are symptoms that are lower respiratory in nature, typically you'll want to see a, an expert to help you tease out what's what and if you need to be concerned about an exacerbation. You know, we talked a lot in this presentation about common things that we're going to see. And it's tough because even those common cold viruses can cause exacerbations in patients who have interstitial lung disease. Um, but that doesn't mean that every single incidence of a cold will cause an exacerbation. Um, in fact, exacerbations typically affect patients only about four to 20%, it's kind of a wide range. Um, but that means 80 to 96% of patients will not have an exacerbation. And certainly uh, more than that number of us are, are getting a cold every year. Um, and with regard to um, pneumonia, um, here's a question that says, um, how, do, how does a physician tell 
Um, and we did talk a little bit about testing, um, but there's a follow-up that says, oftentimes providers say it's viral or it's bacterial before any testing is done. Um, is there some way to know or are they just guessing? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, there's some important clues. So typically if you're sick and it's associated um, early on with a lot of upper respiratory things, so think, you know, if you're having a lot of that uh, cold type symptoms, often if you're having body aches um, or acute fevers, or the symptoms tend to be a little bit like multi-system, so maybe your sinuses are affected, your lungs are affected, you generally feel blah. Those are clues that your provider might use to lean more towards having a viral infection. Um, a bacterial infection um, will typically be a little bit more isolated, although similarly you can have fevers, similarly you cannot feel well. When we're talking about a viral infection that's been complicated by a bacterial infection, typically the way that your providers will have a heads up that that might be occurring is that there'll be a period of, of you having these viral type symptoms. So think cold symptoms, kind of fluish symptoms that then became worse after maybe a week or 10 days. And that's when a lot of doctors, a lot of medical providers will start thinking about adding in antibiotics to the mix. Um, concern that maybe there could be some type of secondary bacterial infection. Now, I, I think that it differs a little bit for the audience here, particularly since patients with ILD obviously have a respiratory uh, uh, underlying disease. And then often many people with ILD are immune suppressed, and we have transplant patients who often attend these. And that can be a little bit of a different scenario and you can present a little bit differently than what the, the typical presentation would be. So what I usually recommend is that if there's concern that testing is done and often what's sent off is we do PCR tests where you know, we look in either a swab or we look in um, a nasal wash is what we often use and look for actual respiratory viruses to kind of prove what the, the clinical assumption is. And then often, you know, your team may ask you, especially if pneumonia is in the consideration to provide sputum cultures, that type of thing. And again, what that'll do is it'll give your, your medical team additional information so that they can tweak or change what maybe the standard of care would be to make sure that all the aspects are being addressed. So I guess to sum it up, there's some clues that can give us an idea of if it's viral or bacterial. And that's what your doctor's gonna say when they're saying, oh, I believe it's viral. Oh, I believe it's bacterial. Um, but if there's any question, typically testing has to be done to confirm that and make sure we're on the right treatment path. Great, great explanation, thank you. Um, I'm gonna stack up a couple questions here. Mm -hmm. So um, the first is, if I think I'm having an exacerbation, should I push through it with bed rest um, as, if you, as if I was having the flu? Um, and when would I know to go to the hospital? And if I were gonna contact a provider, would it be my primary care provider or my pulmonologist? Great questions. Okay, so um, for the first bit, whether you should do bed rest or whether you should push through, you know, some of that depends on, on how you're feeling. I typically encourage people not to, to only be in bed. So even if you're not feeling well, make sure that you're getting rest. But typically I'll say, get up, try to keep moving somewhat because we wanna keep that blood moving so we don't, um, we don't contribute to you getting weaker, we don't contribute to blood clots, that type of thing. So um, while resting can be a great idea, staying home can be a great idea. Um, typically staying in bed all day, I usually say try to avoid it if you can. Um, and then as far as who you can contact. So I think this differs a little bit scenario to scenario and patient to patient. Um, and this is one of the things that I think would be great to have a frank conversation with your pulmonary team about and with your primary care doctor about so you understand everybody's level of comfort. Um, as a rule of thumb, I would say if you're having a simple cold, it's all up in your head, you've kind of had it before, your PCP might be a great place to start. But I think if there's lower respiratory changes, you really are more short of breath, perhaps you've had to turn up your oxygen, or there's been a major change in your cough. I would typically say, let your pulmonologist know. And this is one of the things that I think is so important. And if everybody takes away one thing from this talk, this would be my pick, is that you make yourself a plan. And um, we can't always control when we get sick or what happens, but we can control how prepared we are. 
So I typically encourage my patients to have a little list of the phone numbers they're supposed to call. For example, at our, um, in our clinic, they typically call our nurses directly and that's their first line of defense. And they'll kind of help them tease out, do I need to see my primary care? Do I need to come in for an appointment? Can I call back in two days with an update? So ask your team, they may prefer that you page the on-call doctor, they may prefer you first see your PCP, and that can be a little bit individualized. Did I answer, was there a third part, Jennifer? Uh, I believe, yeah, you, about when to call your doctor. Oh, which, which doctor you should call, I think was the. Okay, okay, yeah, so I think we covered that. When okay. you should call your doctor, I would say for absolutely sure your doctor should be called. Um, if your symptoms are lasting more than a few days and have affected uh, your breathing, if you're more short of breath than usual, and certainly if there's been changes in your oxygen needs, you need to give your doctor a call. Okay, so I'm gonna combine a few questions. There's a couple questions that have come in about immunity. Um, and it says, um, so this person is, uh, is on immunosuppressant medications um, and wonders, do you know how high antibodies should be to be protected from COVID-19? And also, do people on immunosuppressants have less immunity from flu and pneumonia vaccines? And then the third part, um, if I'm immunosuppressed and have no antibodies from the COVID vaccine, should I still get the flu vaccine? Well, these are really good questions. Um, and I'll be honest, I do not know the answer to how high antibodies should be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, immunity is, is a little bit more complicated than just antibodies. So the way I usually talk with my patients about it is that we have antibody mediated immunity. And that's what we typically are checking when we're, we're checking for COVID vaccine effect, efficacy. But there's also cell mediated immunity, which isn't as widely available to check. So, you know, even if we're looking at antibodies, we're looking at one piece of the immunity puzzle, if you will. Um, at this point, the CDC doesn't really recommend that we're checking antibodies. Now, some of the medical community who works a lot with immunosuppressed people, it will be checked. But I'll tell you, I, I don't think that there's, um, there's an actual published or proven cutoff, uh, at least available to the general community, of how high those antibodies need to be. Um, so at this point, I think if you have antibodies, we're saying, great, keep masking, social distancing, being careful. If you don't, we say definitely wear your mask, social distance, be careful. Um, as far as immunosuppressants and other vaccines, such as flu and pneumonia, you know, we don't routinely check efficacy to those. So I think theoretically, if you're on medications that are suppressing your immune system, yes, it's possible you're not getting as much effect from your vaccines. That being said, our recommendations typically are that people do continue to get vaccines. Um, and that, that reason being that we aren't checking, even if you're getting some protection, um, we believe that's better than no protection at all. And the one caveat that I will say is that if you are immune suppressed, um, we do recommend that you never get that live flu vaccine um, because that actually can be dangerous to people who are immune suppressed. So you'll always wanna get the injection form, never the inhaled form of those vaccines to make sure uh, we're getting you as much immunity as possible. Thank you. Um, here's an interesting one. Um, so do, PF patients who are hospitalized with a fast progressing exacerbation get put on the transplant list right away? And how does that work? Okay, great question. Um, so it can depend quite a bit. Often if patients come and they're in the hospital with a fast progressing pulmonary fibrosis, um, often this will tend to be an IPF just because of how the disease progresses. Often transplant teams will be consulted if the feeling is that the damage is too great. Um, a lung transplant workup is a rather lengthy and detailed process. I, I typically describe it as getting the best physical of your life and they're gonna check your entire body to make sure that you're healthy enough to go through, um, through a transplant and that it will actually benefit you and, and not harm you. So in certain cases in a rapidly progressive IPF, it's possible to do those workups while people are in the hospital. And perhaps if the person was already in good health prior to this exacerbation, it's possible they may be able to be listed and get a transplant through what we call um, an expedited transplant workup. 
Um, the issue is, is that often we do have other medical conditions that are going on. And if you're really sick in the hospital, it may not give the transplant team the type of time they need to vet out all of those issues. So I think one of the important things to keep in mind is that the Inter International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant, they put out some nice guidelines about who is a candidate to be seen and consult at a lung transplant center um, and at what point patients should actually get placed on a transplant list. And those are actually quite different from each other. So the guidelines are that anybody who has a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease automatically qualifies to be seen at a lung transplant center. If you have a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease and you wear some type of oxygen, even if it's just when you're exercising, you automatically meet two criteria that, that you can go um, to consult at a transplant center. So what I often encourage people to do is start thinking about transplant well before you think you actually need it. Um, and consider being seen at, at your local transplant center or whatever transplant center you wanna be seen at to say, here's my diagnosis, here's the other things going on with me. Often what's done is people will go through a transplant evaluation early on in their disease course. They'll go through the testing. If there's any uh, issues that need to be resolved, that gives the transplant team time to work through those, time to get to know you. And that way, you know, when the unfortunate event and exacerbation happens, something changes unexpectedly, you already have that relationship. You've already done some of the testing and it makes it much, much easier um, to make sure that transplant stays an option for you. Great, thank you. That's really helpful to know. Um, I We have just another minute. So if you uh, could provide just a brief answer to this question. Um, someone had asked, where do I get a care team? Oh, okay. So everybody should have a care team. So your care team is all the people who are involved in, in taking care of you. So everyone's will look different. So your primary care would be um, a wheel or um, your care team. Um, your pulmonologist would be part of your care team. Perhaps the nurse who works at your pulmonologist's office, part of your care team. Your pharmacist at Walgreens, where you pick up your medications and make sure they're safe for you, part of your care team. So everybody has that. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of making the list and putting straight in our minds exactly who it is who's taking care of us. Great. Um, and I will add that um, just a little plug next month, um, the PFF will be having a webinar about understanding and getting to know the various members of your care team. So information about that will be coming and you can learn a little more then. Um, so make sure you're signed up for our emails. Um, so that was the last question that we could take. And I'm sorry if we did not get to yours, there were a lot of great questions. Um, so uh, I would like to thank Rebecca um, for sharing her expertise with us on this important topic. Um, and thanks to all of you for attending this session and for your very thoughtful questions. Today is the last day of the conference. So it's the last day to earn points and to win prizes. So check out the leaderboard in the activity lounge to see who's been having a great time at Summit this week. Um, thanks again to everyone, and I hope you enjoy the remainder of PFF Summit 21. Thanks again. Rebecca. Thank Have a good day, everyone. Me.